Here we are again, out by the wall. <laughs> I come out here when I want to rant. <laughs> Maybe I should turn around the other way, huh? like Bodhidharma, because I don't seem to be getting through. That would be imitation, so I'm not going to do it. Not my style. I'm going to look you right in the eye and say it. Last time, last episode, I dropped a bomb. I mean, I gave a real bombshell, huh? And guess what? Nobody got it. Well, maybe one or two people got it. But they already knew. <laughs> what was it? That... Within the Buddha's teaching, you can find the whole science of bhakti, the whole method, the whole methodology. And it's called Paticca Samupada, the process of becoming. This was the insight that got me to study Buddhism in the first place. We were in Spain. Me and Ronnie were in Spain. And I forget how we got on the subject, but somehow or other, Buddha Das Bhikkhu came up. Now, Buddha Das Bhikkhu, if you don't know, was a very important Thai monk who was one of the first, if not the first, in Thailand to recognize that the orthodox interpretation of Buddha's teaching was wrong. And especially the orthodox interpretation of Paticca Samuppada. I'm not going to get into all the details, but Ronnie told me about this book that he had written, and I read it. And it floored me because here he is talking about this hidden teaching in the Buddha's teachings. It's not actually hidden. It's right out there in front, but nobody gets it because it's been misinterpreted. And this teaching is precisely the means of operation of bhakti. This process of becoming is exactly, exactly the science of bhakti. Now, I learned bhakti from a traditional guru in India, starting in the 1960s and 70s. And, of course, the way bhakti looks at the Buddha's teaching is not very favorable, <laughs> not very kind either. Uh, they call it uh, monist and voidist and uh, impersonal, and all kinds of nasty things. Well, guess what? It's not any of that. As soon as I got into the actual teaching of the Buddha, I found out that the way the Buddha's teaching is characterized by the, the Vedic people is completely bogus. It's just a lie. It's like this last election that we had in the U.S., where there are just lies against lies against lies. Where's the truth? To find the truth, you have to go back to the source materials. And what the source materials are saying is that they're the same. They're the same teaching. The Buddha never denied the existence of God. He just didn't think it was even worth discussing whether God exists or not. I mean... <laughs> To anyone who can see, huh? God is right there. Everything is. Huh? The, 
Buddha would say, well, that's an extreme statement. <laughs> Everything is. But then the opposite extreme, to say everything is not, is also an extreme statement. Both are misinterpretations. Both are misunderstandings. So one time the Buddha even expounded on this. I think it was in the Potapada Sutta, where he says, to say everything exists is one extreme. But to say everything doesn't exist is the other extreme. The Tathagata, meaning the Buddha, takes the path in the middle. Uh, the famous middle path, which again is completely misinterpreted because he goes on to say, what is this middle path? And then he explains Paticca Samuppada. From ignorance comes fabrications. And fabrications are the requisite condition for consciousness. And so on. Name and form. Name and form is so important. The name and form that we have in our minds determines our consciousness. It is the requisite condition for the arising of consciousness. Without name and form, there would be no consciousness. Why? Because we can only see outside what we have inside. We can only have an experience. We can only be conscious of something if we already have an idea of it. We hear things first from others in most cases. Then we experience them. If we experience something unknown that we have never experienced before, we freak out. Why? We have no words. No categories to explain it. And I've said many times, and I'll say it again, people have spiritual experiences all the time, but they don't recognize them because they have no name and form for them. Their ontology is poverty-stricken. Their understanding is bereft of these things. But if you look, if you can see the whole existence is coming out of nothing and going back into nothing every moment. Huh? The known is coming out of the unknown and going back into it. Not even the unknown, the unknowable. Everything beyond our little bubble of sense perception is unknowable to us. But we can experience certain things through meditation that are beyond the senses, beyond the mind. And then we get this view. This view is that nothing that we experience is whole and complete by itself. It is only whole when it is in relation with the whole, the actual whole. Om Purnamadha Purnamidam. We're not Purnamudachite. Huh? That everything, the whole, is coming out of the whole. W H O L E. But still, the whole remains complete and is not diminished. Purnasya huh? Purnamadaya, Purnameva Vishishi that the whole is emanating all these other wholes, and then they are going back into the whole, and the whole remains complete and undiminished. How is that? Well, our ordinary understanding, our ordinary mathematics doesn't cover, it does not pertain to the absolute. Because the absolute is such that infinite wholes can come out of it and it remains undiminished. Why? Because it's emptiness. It's 
emptiness, it's space. Not even space, it's even more beyond than space. Nothing can exist without space. Everything that exists is held within space. Space is the context, in other words, for all existence. But beyond space is emptiness. Huh? Existence can manifest out of space or within space, and then it merges back into space again and again. But even beyond that, because within space there is potential for becoming, it can't be absolute. It's still going to be perceived in relation to the things that are, being and non-being, matter and space are going to be in relation with one another, but the absolute is not in relation with anything. It is what it is, and that's all. In the absolute, there is no process of becoming. It is simply the isness of what is, the being of what has become, and the non-being of what has gone out of being. All these things are so obvious to one who is realized, to one who can see. Huh? So this process of becoming, this is exactly what bhakti is all about. In bhakti, we create a mind-made body. Huh? Now they want to say that the soul is pre-existing and eternal, but that was added later. The original concept is exactly the same as Buddha's middle path. That out of nothing comes something. And what is that something? It's determined by name and form. So you see in bhakti, the uh, obsessive <laughs> worship of name, uh, the holy name, and of form, the form of the deity. And there's so many temples with all these different deities, all these different forms, all these different names, uh, the thousand names of God and every different uh, appearance or manifestation of God has got a thousand names and thousands of names and so on. But within all of that is the principle of emptiness. How is that you say? Well, consider the story of Shiva. In the beginning of the universe, the demigods and demons churned the ocean of milk. What does that mean? Well, the ocean of milk, milk is like water in Taoism. In Vedas, it's symbolized by milk. And it's knowledge. Not ordinary verbal knowledge, but realized knowledge. Vijnana. They're churning the ocean of milk. And what comes out? Two things, nectar and poison. And this poison was so virulent and so severe and strong that it threatened to destroy the whole universe. Well, what is that? Emptiness. What else could destroy the whole universe? So then what? Lord Shiva came and drank the poison and kept it in his throat. Oh, this is so good. <laughs> this is so cool. Lord Shiva, of course, he's the destroyer. So he drank the poison of emptiness and he kept it in his throat. See? So when, whenever Lord Shiva speaks, he speaks about emptiness. Huh? I mean, in the authentic scriptures. Take, for example, the uh, Bhairav Vigyan Tantra. Bhairav Vigyan Tantra, Shiva gives 112 forms of meditation. And in all of these, he speaks about emptiness without speaking about it, which, of course, is the only way you can really speak about it. <laughs> so Shiva is very cool. And Shiva is holding this emptiness. That seems to imply that of all the Vedic traditions, the Shiva tradition is the most authentic. 
Now, that doesn't mean we should all go running down to the nearest Shiva temple. Because, of course, the tradition has become very much diluted and changed and made into a positivist kind of religion, form of bhakti. And, of course, there's all kinds of arguments and all kinds of sectarian disagreements about all of this. But I'm asking you to, to look through that, go back to the original stories and understand what they mean. So, okay, Shiva is holding emptiness. He's speaking about it without speaking. If you go and read Bhairav Tantra, Vigyan, huh? Vigyan means realized. So he's realized the emptiness. Now he's speaking about it. And in the end, that emptiness will come out of his mouth and destroy the whole universe. So within Buddha's teaching, we have the opposite view, or I should say the inside out view, where the same process that's used in bhakti to attain the higher realms is given as the engine of self-realization, Paticca Samupada. This is how you become enlightened. This is how you become whatever you want to be. Go to any realm, wherever you want to go. You have to create the mind-made body of the particular quality or nature of the place where you want to go. Because how do you go? How do you travel? By leaving one body, taking up another. You get rid of one name and form, and you accept a new name and form. This is samsara. This is going on anyway. Huh? We are all piling up millions of impressions of a particular quality. And most of those impressions are going to be in terms of the quality of the senses of this particular form. So what we're doing in bhakti, what we're doing in Buddhist teaching is that we are piling up impressions of a kind of body with superior senses, with better, more fine-tuned, stronger, and more precise uh, perceptions than the body we have now. And that enables us to go to these higher realms, whether in meditation or by actually taking a body there, taking a life there. This is the great science. This is the great wisdom. This is the secret that has not been revealed in thousands of years. Huh? That the Buddha's teaching and the bhakti religion or tradition are one and the same. They are non-different. One contains the other. Huh? The Vedic tradition contains emptiness in the form of the poison in Shiva's throat. And the Buddha tradition contains bhakti in the form of paticca samupada, which is the same process used by every bhakta in every tradition. So what are we trying to say here? The walls that have been built between different religions and different sects and different processes of self-realization are all artificial. None of them are real. They're only created by priests who want to divide the people. Huh? The politicians are in on it too. Divide the people and separate them so that they're weak enough to conquer and manipulate. There really is no difference between these different religions. And this is what I was trying to get at in the concept of the esoteric teaching a long time ago. But I didn't have the information that I have now. With the information we have now, it's possible to see there really is an esoteric teaching. There really is a tradition and a practice that is at the same time beyond all sectarian religions and includes all sectarian religions and affirms them while at the same time completing them and making them whole. So this is what we're offering. This is the teaching uh, that is available now. It's only available when there's a realized being around. 
It's not available from books. You can't get it just by listening to videos. You have to do the work. You have to do the process yourself. Experience it and understand it by your own personal being. You have to feel it. This will actually allow you to realize the secret of the golden flower.